Hi, this is Mark Birch, and this is a quick analysis of the poetry of John Donne. Moving into the second stanza, we get this transition from referencing physical love to a consideration of spiritual love. And that renders their love universal, an idea that crops up time and time again in Dunn's work. And now, good morrow to our waking souls, which watch one another not out of fear, for love, all love of other sights controls and makes one little room and everywhere. So Dunn's coming back to this conceit that he started with of the lovers waking up, that central idea of the obeyed. Um, so it's a, a literal salutation. He's literally waking up and looking at the sun. And it's also a metaphorical awakening, an awakening of the spiritual connection between the poetic voice and the woman. So the reference to fear is an interesting one here. Um, the fear would, in one reading, be the fear of losing one another. So essentially a form of jealousy. And that might be the kind of thing that uh, ordinary lovers may worry about. They need to keep an eye on each other. But Dunn claims that their souls don't watch one another out of jealousy. They watch one another because they're so into each other. They can't tear their eyes away from each other. Um, they're watching each other just for the pleasure of doing so. And Dunn frequently uses repetition purposefully. Here he's using the word love again and again, perhaps to suggest the all encompassing nature of love, that their love is universal. And he takes this a step further in for love, all love of other sites controls and makes one little room and everywhere. Um, essentially, he's using the concept of the microcosm versus the macrocosm, a very common metaphysical concept. And it's based on the idea that uh, patterns in nature, patterns in the cosmos can be replicated on a smaller scale in humanity. In this case, the bedroom. So the bedroom that Dunn and his lover, or the poetic voice and his lover inhabit, is an everywhere, a representation of everything, or at least everything that's important in the universe. One of the things that's interesting about it is the use of the indefinite article. Uh, that indefinite article reinforces the paradox. It's an everywhere. It's not everywhere, but an everywhere, suggesting that there's more than one everywhere. Um, you can sense the paradox. But that's something that can be rationalised through the concept of the mi microcosm. The room is the only thing that matters in the universe. So it's not a denial of the existence of everything else. But it's a recognition that the only thing that does matter is here. This room is the universe to the lovers. So one of the things that's also worth recognising that's significant with this is that it's one little room. Um, he does a kind of double pre-modification of the noun room with adjectives that indicate its you know, really diminutive nature. So that contrast to everywhere is made even more profound. The lovers don't need a huge amount of space. Everything they need is in that room. It's each other. They are the universe to each other. So this concludes with let sea discoverers to new worlds have gone. Let maps to other worlds on worlds have shown. Let us possess one world, each half one and this one. And obviously the word let really stands out. Um, Dunn's using it in the sense of allow, permit, accept. So that having established that the room is an everywhere, he's explicitly pointing out that he is accepting that there are other things in the world, the wider world, the world that's meaningless. But that anaphora of let, which is essentially, you know, beginning each of the clauses with that same word, through its repetition conveys the wide range of things that exist. But Dunn's rejecting them as meaningless, as pointless, and he's really calling, I suppose, on his beloved to reject them as well. They are meaningless. All that matters is this room. 
So the sea discoveries are interesting from a contextual perspective because Elizabethans regarded them as really incredibly heroic. They were risking their lives to discover uncharted regions and bring back incredible commodities that had never been heard of before. They were, they were the rock stars, the film stars of the generation. But Dunn is essentially dismissing them. They're not needed. They're not worth our time or consideration because it's only this room that matters. Then we go into the cartographers who represent worlds on worlds. So cartographers are literally taking you know, small bits of paper, piling them onto a globe and creating a world. It's a creation of the microcosm. A globe is a perfect representation of the kind of microcosm that Dunn's already been exploring through the concept evidenced in the small room representing it and everywhere. So this is a perfectly apt comparison to use. And it's interesting that he repeats the world, the word worlds. The repetition of worlds could complement that sense of multiplicity that we've seen through the structural anaphora already, um, as well as representing the process involved in layering these images onto a globe to ultimately create a world. So why use this theme of discovery? Well, as I've already said, um, sea discoverers, adventurers were idolised in the Elizabethan period, and so it was a very common metaphysical concern. It was an exciting um, period and an exciting pursuit, and perhaps Dunn's exploiting that. Perhaps Dunn is suggesting that that kind of excitement and adventure can be found in his microcosm, their microcosm, the bedroom. But the stanza ends with this quite complex philosophical notion. Let us possess one world, each have one and is one. So the world is the lover's possession, but while each lover possesses a world, they also are a world. Um, you can see why that's so complex. But essentially Dunn suggesting that the world of their love, which is singular and unified because it's one love, is also a product of the pair of them. So they're two in one. They are lovers, but sharing a single unified love. They are the universe. They are the microcosm. They are the world. Moving into the final stanza, my face in thine eye, thine in mine appears. We get this conceit introduced of the eyes as two parts of the world, extending that concept presented at the end of the last stanza. Um, the initial idea draws on this way in which the proximity of Dunn and his beloved allow their images to appear in each other's eyes. Again, you've got this idea of each have one and is one. So that if you look really closely in someone's face, in a bit of an alarming way, you get really up close, you can see your own reflection there. It's a creation of a world within another world. And what we have here is done using chiasmus, creating a kind of grammatical balance, my face in thine eye, thine in mine appears, that mirrors the kind of balance in the relationship. But the reversal that you get, uh, face in thine, thine in mine, that reversal of syntax could symbolise the mirroring of the images in the eyes, that kind of reversal that's that done so cleverly recognising. And true plain hearts do in the faces rest. Well, here Dunn's focusing on the honesty of the love that can be seen in the faces uh, when he looks into the eye of his lover and she looks into his eye, um, that we have what's reflected back to them as truth, true and plain. Uh, both of those words function as synonyms for honest. And the synecdoche of hearts is interesting because again, it suggests that the love that that organ represents dominates each of the lovers. You know, we still obviously, you know, reference hearts all the time when we think of love. Where can we find two better hemispheres without sharp north, without declining west? Well, Dunn's wittily merging these conceits now. We've got hemispheres in terms of the eyes, and we've got the hemispheres that would be put together by a cartographer to form a globe. So hemispheres represent half of the whole, half of the whole in the same way that the lovers are those two parts of a whole to become that unified um, love that we just uh, referred to. Hence, together they possess one world. Um, 
And the sphere that's created by two hemispheres would have been particularly uh, recognisable and symbolic for an Elizabethan in terms of Greek geometry. It represented perfection. And here it's the perfection of their true and pure love. These hemispheres, the hemispheres that represent the lovers, are better than the globe. They're better than the hemispheres of the planet because they lack the deficiencies that the globe does possess. When we're thinking about sharp north, we're thinking about um, the North Pole, the cold wastes of the north. Um, and when we think about declining west, we're thinking about the place where the sun sets, an ending, a going down, um, a, a finality that their love lacks, um, lacks in a positive way. That's a poor choice of phrase. But their love has no end. Their love has no cold spell. Their love is pure and refined. And again, we've got parallelism being used. Um, it creates, as parallelism generally does, a sense of harmony, a sense of balance without sharp north, without declining west. You can hear the syntactic balance that you've got there, that parallelism that could represent that perfect form of the lover's world. The way it is harmonious and balance, balanced and devoid of any of those negatives that we find in the actual world. We then move on to another metaphysical concern. Whatever dies was not mixed equali. Um, Dunn seems to be referencing the medical uh, theory of the four humours derived from the ancient Greek philosophers beliefs that the body was composed of four elements or humours that had to remain balanced in order for the body to be healthy. Um, and the belief was that if it could remain balanced in perpetuity, it would lead to essentially immortality. So you have to have an imbalance of the humours in order to die. And already we've seen that Dunn is suggesting that, you know, through his imagery of the hemispheres, that there is balance in his love, in their love, in the microcosm of their love, and therefore by implication, their love will not die. Um, also, whenever Dunn uses the word dies, he could well be regarded as punning because it was um, a colloquial Elizabethan reference to orgasm. Um, and the widely held belief was that the sexual act reduced life expectancy by a day. So Dunn might be denying the purely physical aspect of the relationship. It exists on a spiritual plane that makes it eternal. It's not subject to these kinds of deaths. It's not subject to the kind of physical decay that an ordinary lover might experience. And then we have the final couplet. If our two loves be one, or thou and I love so alike that none do slacken, none can die. It reinforces Dunn's conclusion, but there is an element of uncertainty because of that conditional, if our two loves be one. Now that uncertainty could be directed towards the beloved because her love has got to mirror his in order for the love to be eternal. It's got to be mixed equally. It's no good him, you know, loving her profoundly and her loving him quite a lot. You know, there's got to be that equality there. Otherwise, it won't be mixed equally and that physical decay could be reinforced. There would be a death to the love. But if they both love equally, it's eternal. So there's this plea for equality and balance that's echoed in the syntactic parallelism that we have once again. Love so like that non do slack and non can die, non do slack and non do die. So you've got this sense of balance and harmony once again. So just taking a look at uh, the structure to conclude, we've got three regular septets. We've got a regular AB, AB, CCC rhyme scheme. There are six lines of iambic pentameter followed by one line of iambic hexameter in each stanza. So what you've essentially got is structural regularity. And that regularity could complement the harmony and balance of the love between Dunn and his beloved. Something that he's been stressing throughout the poem. They are, are in balance. They are mixed equally. They are two become one. Okay, so.